How are you? I'm fine, thanks. Um, I already know who you are and your names and everything, but our viewers out there don't know. Yeah. So do you mind you know, telling yeah, them? My name is Kasim Kaira. Okay. Yes, and uh, I'm a journalist mm. and a farmer. A journalist and I mean, that's the greatest combination. <laughs> <laughs> who out there can say they're a journalist and a farmer? Yeah. Now, Mr. Kaira, give us um, a bit of your background, your personal background, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was born in Barara. Mm. In Western Uganda. Western Uganda, yes. Yes, and um, I'm kind of uh, from a mixed parentage, mm. so I have a lot of mixtures in my blood. Mixed I with. Know, I don't know what percentage is what percentage. <laughs> you can check. It's Uganda. It's yeah. uh, Rwanda. It's, oh. uh, it's, it's, it's Rwandese blood in there. Yeah. By extension, there is Congolese blood in there. And oh really? Uh, yes, and then Jihima blood very close by. Yeah. It's it's just all over. It's, it's a mix, but I think. <laughs> But that has helped as well. Mm. I speak 12 languages. Wait, can we name them? If you don't mind. Because <laughs> I'm in shock. Run out, run out. I'll just go for four and then the rest I'll just leave. No, let's do that. Let's, <laughs> let's just go through them. Because I also want to learn uh, the first one. No, let's, let's, let's start with English. Okay. Um, French. Okay. Arabic. Okay. Swahili. Okay. Then Kenya Rwanda. Kirundi. Luganda. Nyankore. Uh. Nyoro. Toro, those yeah. are the, 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 the R's already. Yeah. yeah, then they have Kikamba in Kenya. Oh, yeah. I lived in Machakos, so I am actually considering, I consider myself as a Mkamba match. Oh. <laughs> that, that's the Kenyan connection. Yeah. Yes, and then you, uh, in Congo, actually, I speak about four or five languages in Congo. Because oh, yeah. there's so many languages, but once you know one language, and that's one thing you realize as with Bantu languages, mm. once you speak one, then you're able to uh, tap into the other, like the Mashi now, yeah. uh, the Kinande, um, the Lendu. Yeah. I, I do I do understand when once people start talking you and then get... Lingala a little bit of it. Oh. I do yeah, I, I do I do fumble with it, but I, I do understand oh. the French connection in it I think helps. Yeah. Yes. That's quite fascinating. You know, um for those who don't know you were a journalist, can we say where you were a journalist, you know? Yes, I'm a journalist and um I like the, the place you worked at. Oh, places. Okay, yeah. yeah. I started my journalism career in Rwanda, mm. Rwanda Television, okay. immediately after the 1994 genocide. Mm. And so I was one of the new breed because in Rwanda there was the issue of either journalists who participated mm. as part of the hate campaign, hate speeches, mm. and therefore were part of the genocide uh, system, or there were those who were actually victimized. So you ended up with some who were in prison, some who had died, some who had fled the country. Mm. So I, 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 I just finished university, IU, IU in Bali. Yeah. And I went to Rwanda and it was virgin territory. Basically, they, they were getting their first television. They never had a TV before yeah. that. Uh, and so we were the new breed of journalists who yeah. received fast track training. We got really like the, some of the best training mm. in some of the best schools. For example, I was pushed to the University of Wales in Cardiff in the uk okay uh, to go and do you know broadcast journalism yeah fast track training i was sent to belgium to one of the best schools in film so i was oh. doing camera work you know, and whatever yeah so within nine months of joining the television i was already editor oh, wow. nine months it never happens in, in real life yeah you know, but because of the demand that was there okay. uh, you know and then the flexibility i taught i self-taught my friend I, mm. I taught myself french i never went into a french class but because I was as editor, then you get to learn to that. Learn. Yes. So uh, that's where my journalism career began. Mm. I actually went in at a very interesting time as well. And that's why, you know, for my kind of experience, with my kind of age and time in the media, probably I'm, I'm, I'm older than my age mm. in terms of the experience that I've had. Mm. Because I went to Rwanda, 1996, 97, the Rwandan troops and Ugandan troops went into Congo to remove, which was Zaire yeah. then, to remove Mobutu Sese Seko. Yeah. Brought in Laurent Desiree Kabila, the mm. senior. Mm. And I was covering, I followed the Rwandan troops as they went all the way to Everything. Kinshasa, covered. So I was a war correspondent of, uh, between 1996 and 1999, actually okay. going all the way nearly to 2001. Mm. So that really had like immediate exposure to a young man who was mm. ambitious, you know, you were sort of in the, getting into the game. Yeah. And that propelled me into the experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, 2003, uh, bef uh, the, I left Rwanda Television in 2001, mm. joined an American organization called Internews Network. Okay. It's really one of the best post-conflict media training organizations. Okay. And they've worked in countries, especially in the former Soviet Union mm. and so on. Uh, but then they had also started coming into the region. Yeah. One of the best teams, actually one of the best organizations with media training mm. uh, internationally is that internews mm. then there is search for common ground which is another very good one which was mainly based in burundi yeah. so i got a chance to work with internews as their chief editor in rwanda yeah. uh, 
2001, 2002, 2003, mm-hmm. I left for the BBC. Oh. So I managed to get hooked into the BBC. Yeah. And that was like the, the, the ultimate, the yeah. ultimate for any 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 journalist. You'd really want to go to that's the, the BBC. The <laughs> that's, the, that's many people's dreams. Yeah. And I grew up listening to the BBC, you know, like from childhood. My yeah. father would have this Swahili BBC, Swahili there. Yeah. You listen to Dira Dunia, then you go to Deutsche Villa. So we had already built up a sort of a base for that. At university, I, I was the one producing the university magazine called The Comet. I founded it and started producing it. Yeah. So while I was doing education as a course, I was already in journalism and I was Minister of Information as well at the uni. Yeah. So that built up from Rwanda, BBC. Mm-hmm. BBC I was there for since 2004 mm-hmm. until 2015. Yeah. 2015 I left to come back home and embark on farming. Yeah. But along the way while I was planning my farming, Azam TV, which was a big TV that was that just started in Tanzania. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the bosses there knew me and they were watching me. I'm actually much more popular in Tanzania than I am in Uganda. Really? Not many people know me in Uganda. In Tanzania, you know, I just, from the airport all the way like to the hotel, it's just knows. selfies and, and, and autographs. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's different. <laughs> yeah. So they they asked me because they, were, they wanted to expand. Mm. And so I was given to be bureau chief for the Great Lakes region. So I was oh. in charge of Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, DRC, yeah. South Sudan, okay. but based in Kampala. Oh. So that really gave me a very good landing for me. Yeah. That's actually where the, much of the money that went to establish Dream Harvest Farm for what it is. Yeah. And I'm grateful to Azam TV, really. Uh, because I came in here, you can imagine leaving Europe. Yeah. Got into a job that was paying me nearly three times what the BBC was paying me. Yeah. And I'm home. So the expenses <laughs> are next to nothing. Same. And then you have a lot of money at your disposal. Yeah. So that helped me really to push over the next three and a half years mm. uh, as bureau chief to work on the farm. So I would be Monday to Friday, I'm at work. Weekends, you never see me in town. <laughs> Not a wedding, no nothing. I would just be at the farm. Mm. And I made it deli- a deliberate effort and I think it paid off. Yeah. And at the time, I sort of decided to leave. 2019, they asked, they say, Kasim, with your experience, we would want you to come to Tanzania, be based in Tanzania and train the journalists there. Yeah. And I said, when I joined the Azam TV, it was clear that my duty station would be in Kampala. Yeah. Moving me to Dar es Salaam with what I've done here, I think would inconvenience my projects. Hmm. So we had a mutual departure. I, I was allowed to leave, to leave because I couldn't go to Tanzania. Yeah. And then that allowed me now to go into the freelance that I'm doing. Oh. And then surprise, surprise, I'm back at the BBC, but in a freelance capacity, I can't, <laughs> I can't go back into yeah. full time now when I have the farming, the farm to attend. To. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, now, can we talk about your transition from um, working as a journalist to becoming a farmer? Mm-hmm. What's that whole process? Like what you had to go through, your preparations and all that? It, it's, it's a lot more psychology mm-hmm. than, than the physical. Because you can imagine when you're used to wearing a tie, yeah. you know, you're just <laughs> in the office in the, you know, nine to five. five. You're just dealing with news. It's scripts that you're dealing with. You're mm. editing people's scripts, who reporters who have sent scripts from the field and so on. Mm. And then all of a sudden having to get your hands dirty. From, from, you know, from the laptop to urine, to rabbit urine. <laughs> wow. You know, That's a catchy like... <laughs> one. From the laptop to rabbit urine. <laughs> <laughs> from, nice. you know, from, from the laptop where you're just clicking away to rabbit urine. Yeah. You know, having, you know, to clean the clean the goat pen yeah you just have clean to see out. and you have to show that you are there because one thing about workers if they know that you are fully reliant on them mm. then they will they will think they are big but if they know that what they are doing you can do mm. probably sometimes even better mm. then actually that puts you in a very good position yeah. so i had to psychologically prepare myself for what i was going to mm. especially and also preparing my family because that was something very alien mm. my wife you know despite she comes from the north mm-hmm. um Despite coming from the north, she had grown up in Kampala. Yeah. Never, you know, holding a hole, oh. whatever. <laughs> having to get her to get to the ground yeah. was, was, was hard work. But her inspiration was always there. She mm. knew she knew what I loved. She knew what I wanted. And she thought, you know, this is a sacrifice we have to make. Yeah. And it had to be a sacrifice as well. Because like leaving the BBC and coming to Uganda to start the farming, I left the family there. Mm. So it had to be a lot of patience from my wife, from my children, yeah. missing me that much but for us to be able to live the dream. So it, it took the psychological preparation, but also the mindset because I knew what I wanted. And every day, I think I was getting to cl- closer and closer to that. Mm. With all the frustrations along the way, you know, you do something and it doesn't ca- happen the way you want it. Mm. You're falling, tap yourself on the back, get what? moving again. Yeah. So it, for me, th- that was really the inspiration. I just mm-hmm. thought I can't leave that. Mm. And that has kept me going. So yeah. it, it, it was a challenge. Yeah. But the moment I could, I got the psyche right. Yeah. 
the physical aspect was easy. My body had been, uh, you know, had, had worked in very dangerous areas. Mm. You know, like some of the conflict zones that you know, Somalia, you know, uh, DRC, yeah. uh, Central African Republic, Mali, I've been. Everywhere. I've been. And, 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 you know, if you've been through danger, then you, mm. ap- you appreciate life. the troubles. But then a shepherd's life, that's why you'll notice that all the prophets of God were mm. shepherds. Mm. And shepherding, you know, shepherding takes a lot of patience. If you yeah. cannot be patient, you cannot look after animals. And my patience was put to the test, and I've survived it so far. Amen to that. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, um, you've been you've been to Uganda. You are in Uganda. You're Ugandan, yes. but you've also been in the diaspora. Yes. So we can call you diasporan or something <laughs> like that. Yes. And there's a new project that you're working on. I'd like you to tell our viewers about it. Yes, I, I've been looking around, mm. and especially following the these last elections. I think they, they were the sort of the turning point in terms of mobilization of diaspora. Uh. But even before that, people were sort of coming and enjoying, you know, sort of saying, Kasim, what are you doing? People mm. couldn't believe, even people in, in UK. Mm. Kasim has gone back home. You know, it was like wow. it was the story of you know this was, <laughs> this was our BBC. I, I, I'm the star of the community. I'm one of the stars in the community. Saying this is our person in the BBC. Mm. Now we're just quitting. You know, putting the mic down and saying you're going farming. People could not really con- understand it. Mm. You've had people who have lived in Europe for 20, 25 years. The longer you you stay there, mm. the more you become actually very. It becomes very difficult for you to leave. Oh yeah, you get attached in ways that really don't allow you to be able to move. Mm-hmm. And I'd never allowed myself to be in that position because, like, annually would come, would bring the kids here yeah. every year. You know, we are in Uganda, we also we go to Rwanda, we go yeah. to Kenya. We are showing them the places, and we are trying to say, "This is Africa. This is home." For me, the heart has always been back here. Yeah, with all the good things that we get there, which we appreciate, mm. still home is still home. So for the community, it was very difficult to even understand, you know, why, you know, Kasim would, would just leave, you mm. know, and, and go back. Yeah. And therefore, it took a bit of courage for me to sort of, you know, prepare myself, mm. know that I was going to do that. So I started seeing, but now with the election, with the last elections, the diaspora came out and started fundraising a lot of money that went into different oh, campaigns, yeah. into different candidates' campaigns. Yeah. And I could see you could just tune into a Zoom session and you see how much money has been raised just very quickly to go and treat people who have been beaten up wherever, whatever. And I just thought, if we could get this energy together, mm. if we could get these resources together, work together for once, because everybody was doing their thing, you know, their separate ways. Mm. Dream Harvest Farm, probably, if it was a partnership now, would have had a lot more money because you could, get, if it was a partnership with several people. Yeah. But because I was alone, with my wife, it just had to depend on that little money, yeah. which you had to build up probably seven months, eight months. Mm. Yet, with the diaspora put together, within ma- one month, you just do it. Yeah. So, I started, I started, uh, and thanks to COVID, mm-hmm. because with people, with the lockdowns and people being forced to remain home, Zoom was discovered. Zoom came into our yeah. lives to change our lives. So, we started interacting with people in America, in Australia, in ways that we had not interacted Before. before. So as part of the conversation now, I was brought in to be sort of a motivational speaker, tell oh. people about what is happening home. Mm-hmm. A lot of what is happening in the diaspora, unfortunately, is ignorance. There are people who have been away too long. Mm-hmm. When they come, they're just coming, renting an apartment in Bukoto, yeah. going to hotels going around to town. Bukoto, they end no, up Kololo. at the Tebe, they're in Kololo. The yeah. next thing, they are back on the plane and they, you know, they, they don't know what is happening. Mm-hmm. I have driven the breadth and length of this country. There is no border that I have not been to in this country. Wow. And that in itself actually is very telling. You go all the way to Karamoja, mm. you see the tarmac, you go to Kapchoro, you go down in Kisoro, yeah. go east, you know, go all the way to Mbale. Because these are areas that I've, I've known. And then I, I, I decided this is the time to go and explore these areas. Mm. So I go with an open mindset. And that for me really was a life changer. Yeah. So I start speaking to people and I tell them, go to Uganda. Yeah. Visit Uganda. Visit Uganda. Visit Uganda. <laughs> Uganda. Come and see what is happening. Yeah. Visit people's farms. Before actually, before I went into the farming, part of it was part of the research was visiting farmers. Mm, Agro tourism. Yes. Like well, I was visiting farmers. Yeah. And we set out at the same time with Grace Boji, who is now very popular. We have actually very good friends. Yeah. The goat farmer, then the goat lady. Yes. We started off at the same time. Actually, we're doing visits even at some in some instances together. Yeah. On on people's different farms. farms. And the idea was, if you understand Uganda, then you'll appreciate it. Yeah. I started speaking about Uganda, and many in the diaspora were saying, eh, Kaira, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, they were just telling me that. Overhyping up. I was hyping up. And I yeah. said, no, 
For yeah. me, all I'll do is I'll go and film the videos. So whenever I'm traveling, I'm filming. Mm. And I'm saying, I'm not just saying, this is the evidence. Mm. Here is my evidence. Mm. So I said to people, if we got together like, you know, 40, 50 people mm. and we did a project, yeah. this could make a difference. Yeah. People said, let's give, let's give it a try. Okay. So what have we done? We have bought land now. Yeah. 20 acres of land. Yeah. We, are, we are establishing an estate. Yeah. It's called the London Village. <laughs> and we are hoping that this now will be a template. It's the first time, probably, if I'm not wrong, mm. it, it might be the first time that you are getting 50 people in the diaspora putting together to come and put together an estate. Mm. Not for purposes of just renting out or selling. It's for people to come and live there. You. Because we've lived away so long. Yeah. You come back. You need to make new friends as you're aging. Yeah. So we are saying the people that you've grown up with are easy people that you will be able to associate with. True. So while you have your house wherever in Bukoto, Nadia, wherever, mm. You can still have a house in this estate where you will be with the family. Mm. Establish the things that you want. Football pitch, a hall, have garden, community yeah. garden where people can actually go and garden. Yeah. It's, it, you do the small, small gardening for your onions, for your tomatoes, the yeah. kitchen garden that you can actually you can know, service, access, use, yeah. service you. And suddenly it caught up. Yeah. So suddenly as we came and we bought the land, immediately more people are saying, yeah, that's a, it's the same thing I wanted to say. What yeah. if some people want to join? No, no, no. They said we want to join, but there were still people in the diaspora. Oh. So we are saying this is phase one. We are going into phase oh, two. Phase. So we are going to expand it out. Okay. So we bring in another 50 people and then we expand it. Yeah. In the meantime, it becomes very easy for you to approach the government, for example, and say, we have an estate, we need roads here, how can you help us? By sub counties, the community, the, the sub counties can easily provide you with a tractor to go and clear the land. You just buy the fuel and cater for the driver. Mm. The tractors are there. It becomes easy for the government, you know, like to deal with to people help. who are together. If it's electricity, it's easy. It's, this is 50 people that you are dealing with yeah. instead of one person who wants to bring in the electricity. If it's water, the same, same thing. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking along those lines. But beyond that, we're also thinking we should think bigger. Mm. And we said we want to do a highway a project, a much bigger project. I got together 50 people again in yeah. the diaspora. This one was much more widespread, uh -huh. you know, beyond just the London village, because yeah. London village is so much about UK. Mm. With the, with, with the, we, so we have a group that is called Kiriandongo Investment Group, mm -hmm. and we, 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 we invented Kiriandongo. Mm -hmm. And we went because land was relatively cheaper, yeah. but also that road is South Sudan, is Uganda's you know, most, biggest trading partner. That's mm -hmm. where we sell most of our commodities, mm -hmm. South Sudan. It has the border, it's, it's the connection to the whole of the north of the country. Yeah. West Nile, you know, Miragulu, whatever. Yeah. It's a connection also to Machison Falls National Park, mm. which is big. So for tourism, you know, that is definitely something. Beyond that, it also connects to the, to the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Yeah. You see what is happening along that road. And as Amos Wekesa would be saying, yeah. watch that road. And I think we went straight in. So we've already secured land there. And we're going to try to come up with a project, mm. which now because of its infancy, I won't go into the details of, okay. but it is a service that is lacking in Uganda. Mm. Because one of the biggest things that are lacking in Uganda is the service. The service sector is still sick. Lacking. It's not even not limping. It is absolutely sick. Mm. So you want to be able to bring in standards that would be able, how long would it take you, for example, if you went to a restaurant and said, give me food mm. on the highways? 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an, an hour. hour. Does a person want to wait that long? No. That's what we want to break. So it's, it's part of it's part of the bigger service industry that we want to look into. Yeah. And this is the diaspora doing that. Yeah. People are very keen and there. So it's, it's a template. If we are lucky, if we are successful with that, that means now That's other cool. people will copy that. Wow. And I hope we will. I hope they do. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> we've given it all it takes. We've just got the best consultants in the in, in the industry mm. to sort of come in and help us. Mm. And so we are building it up. But it's mm. money that is actually importantly money that is not borrowed from the banks. It's okay. people's personal um, savings. Let, let's talk about that. That you you emphasize the money is not from the banks. Yes. The money is from the people. Yes. Oh. The reason I'm saying the reason I'm emphasizing that is because. Uganda is one of those countries that you're going to have very inhibitive interest rates if you're going to borrow. Mm. So 21% where other countries are having like 4% or 9%, Five. you yeah. can just imagine what that means. Mm. But also importantly, because for some, especially from a faith perspective, as a Muslim, mm. we don't take interest loans. Oh, Therefore, Islamic the banks, banking. Yes, the banks are out. Mm. And Islamic banking hasn't started. If it had started, I think we would really have a good reason to go and approach them. Yeah. But since they haven't started, we are going with what we have. That means then the project delays. So you will have to wait for five months when people are still saving, saving, yeah. whatever you get in the pool. But the good thing is being a part of a group 
if you have for example 100 pounds per person mm. for five months that's 500 pounds mm. times 50 people that is definitely something so it you can actually do stuff on the ground yeah yeah and we're hoping then once it becomes clear other diasporas now will start picking a leaf and mm. if we start putting together such energies the sky is the limit wow yeah oh that that was <laughs> It's like, you know, someone who preaches to someone. <laughs> it's like, I was paying attention. I hope everyone actually did pay attention. Now, any last words, any last remarks to your people out there? What's that last word you want to put out there? We, should love, we should love our country. We should Preach. love our country. And in loving a country, I think you give it. You don't mm. just take from it. Mm. Uh, and by giving it just means the engineer who is working or supervising a road construction mm. If he doesn't take the bribe and therefore pass a road that has not fulfilled the the, 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 the stuff that is supposed to fulfill the requirements, mm-hmm. it means then the road that would have lasted 20 years, mm. well, if they eat the bribe, then it will last only 10 years and then we are back to the begging table. It's about loving the country. So the engineer now becomes sensitive to that. Mm-hmm. People now start thinking about investing back home, but also importantly, praying for the country to be peaceful. Thank because you. minus peace... There is nothing that can happen. We are thinking about all these things because there is peace. peace. The moment there is any deficit in peace, mm-hmm. then there is a serious problem. Investments shy away very quickly from a lack of peace, from instability. Tourism cannot thrive under instability. Yeah. So you, we, we need to pray for the peace, but we need to work for the peace as well. You cannot just pray for it. We need to work <laughs> towards nothing. ensuring that there is peace. Yeah. But also happy, you know, living in harmony, but also spreading out. Mm. One uh, one challenge that I found with many of the diaspora, you have you find people who have grown up in towns. A person was born in Kawempe, in yeah. Baise, in Katwechi Nyoro, in Deva, yeah. telling that person to just venture out just to Bombo, which is 20 miles, yeah. the person feels like you have buried them alive. <laughs> so taken people to need village. to start opening up their minds and part of it will be visit Uganda, mm. travel across the country and see what is happening. Mm. See how people's lives are changing on the ground. Well, poverty is there and it's the truth. Mm. But the more you go into the villages, because for example, just think about our Kiriandongo project. How many people are going to get jobs out of that? You know, you're creating yeah. jobs. You're, you're opening up a market that has not been existing. Yeah. You, 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 are, you, you, are, you are facilitating a process. And therefore, I think also the government has to come in. Mm. Look into the potential of the diaspora. This I can you know, shout it out much louder. Mm. Government needs to notice how much the diaspora is capable of. Mm. You look at diasporas like India's diaspora, the Philippines, Indonesia, Ethiopia. Mm. These countries have been built up by diasporas. You look at a government like Eritrea, which has been under embargo for so many years. Part of its survival, a significant chunk of its survival, is depending on its diaspora, a huge diaspora that is out there. Yeah. Now that we are getting Ugandans moving to the Middle East in huge numbers, yeah. let's tap into this. Mm. Government can start creating zones and say this is something for Dubai. Yeah. Some people, you know, like in Saudi Arabia. Yeah. They allocate land. It is planned. It is well planned. We can avoid the confusion that is in Kampala. Everybody shouldn't squeeze in Kampala. Too much traffic. Let's go out and plan cities. Let's have towns that are well planned. Mm. It takes me, you know, like it takes me just 30 minutes by that traffic in Kawempe there yeah. in at Kobil. If I just live there, get to Bombo, mm. it's only 30 minutes. 30 minutes and I live a pollution-free life mm. in comparison to squeezing. Pollution-free. Yeah, but because, I mean, you're, you're just on the yeah. farm. It's quiet. You're, you're, fresh air. All you're getting is fresh air from the trees. Mm-hmm. Instead of coming and squeezing into increasingly smaller spaces. Mm. So we need to start thinking. The more we decongest the city, yeah. the more we allow even the city to develop, we can get new buildings coming yeah. up. But that's the only way that mm. we can have that. Yeah. So my message is, Uganda is good. Uganda is <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Enjoy. <laughs> Enjoy your country <laughs> yeah. and build your country. That's so lovely. Now, let's imagine someone wants to contact you. Do you mind giving them your contact info? It's kaira2000 at yahoo.fr. Okay. Or on Facebook, just my name, Kasim mm. Kaira, and then we'll take it up from there. Yeah, and they can contact you about anything. Okay. Well, business. anything related to this. Yeah. Oh, this yeah. You want to join the, his face and whatnot, Absolutely. his project. Not can, marriage. <laughs> and you say contact oh, me about everything sorry. <laughs> oh he's a married man guys so please no no I'm a Muslim they, oh. they, they oh. for, yes, so they, but <laughs> let's, not, keep, not let's be professional okay <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. let's not try that well, I was just kidding yeah but thank you so much thank you so much for coming to us today thank you for your time thank you for having me anytime thank you so much